This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. More Americans than ever are opposed to the president's health care overhaul. Wall Street is circling its financial wagons, and now there is new concern over another major problem involving Obamacare. First, the worst polling yet for the plan. 59% in our new Fox poll oppose it, just 36% favor it. Those are both records. Also today, Moody's credit agency downgraded its outlook for health insurers from stable to negative based on what it called the ongoing unstable and evolving environment. There's also word tonight Obamacare patients and their families could end up paying for coverage they did not use, even from beyond the grave. Correspondent Dan Springer has the details from Seattle. 56-year-old Tom Giolanella was shocked to find out he qualified for Medicaid under Obamacare. He was able to retire early years ago, owns his home outright in this pricey Seattle area neighborhood, and is living off his investments. He wanted no part of the government's so-called free health care. I did not want to be on Medicaid because it's supposed to be a safety net program. It's not be, it's supposed to be for somebody who has assets that can, can pay the bill. I used to pay the bill. I, I, I didn't want money from, from the government for that. After reading the fine print, Giolanella had another reason to flee Medicaid, the potential death debt. States are allowed to recover the cost of care after death by seizing assets. It's been the law since 1993 when states were going broke over rising Medicaid expenses. But under Obamacare, Medicaid eligibility has expanded. The asset test was thrown out, allowing millions more to qualify. But like Giolanella, others won out. The Seattle Times reported on a couple in their early 60s who got married so their combined income bumped them out of Medicaid into the exchange. One wanted to be able to will her home to her children free and clear. The story prompted the state of Washington to make an emergency rule saying it could only recover the cost of nursing home care. So we have this population that we want to make sure they have access to health care, that they can get in, that they can get the kind of services that keep them healthy. But most states are not lowering the amount they can collect. A decade ago, yeah. California took more than $44 million through a state recovery, a number that figures to skyrocket with upwards of 2 million more Medicaid recipients by next year. Critics see a money grab. I think that people are maybe in for a shock when they find out that their heirs are going to be paying for care that they didn't even use because they got in, into a, a system under false pretenses. A state recovery is made more complex by the fact collection varies so widely from state to state. The whole issue is so under the radar, interest groups like AARP are still studying it to see how under Obamacare seniors will be affected. Brett? Dan Springer in Seattle tonight. Dan, thank you. Sales of existing homes edged up slightly in December, lifting sales for 2013 to the highest level in seven years. But there were steep losses on Wall Street today. The Dow tumbled 176. The S&P 500 dropped 16. The Nasdaq fell 24. American attitudes about how President Obama handled the Benghazi terror attacks are downright cynical tonight. A whopping 49 percent, almost half, believe false information was given in order to protect the president, president politically just weeks before the election. 22 percent chalk it up to a mistake, 19 percent to protecting the country. One of the key figures in the Benghazi saga is defending his old boss, the U.S. ambassador who was murdered during the terror attacks. Here's Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Having served as Ambassador Chris Stevens' deputy at the time of the Benghazi attacks, whistleblower Greg Hicks riveted a House hearing last May with explosive and often emotional testimony. And I got the ambassador on the other end, and he said, Greg, we're under attack. Now, in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, Hicks is defending Stevens against last week's Senate Intelligence Committee report, which said the slain ambassador twice turned down offers by General Carter Hamm of AFRICOM to extend the tour of duty in Libya of a 16-man special forces team. Chris Stevens was not responsible for the reduction in security personnel, Hicks writes. His requests for additional security were denied or ignored. Officials at the State and Defense Departments in Washington made the decisions that resulted in reduced security.
Cables signed by Stevens in the months leading up to the attacks, first disclosed by Fox News, show he had repeatedly warned Washington about the deteriorating environment in Benghazi. Hicks now claims it was then Defense Secretary Leon Panetta who, without consulting Stevens, shifted the Special Forces team from personnel protection to a training mission, and that it was Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy, the powerful Foreign Service officer who oversees all State Department buildings and personnel worldwide, that rejected DOD's offer. So many of these decisions seem to be at uh, Ambassador Kennedy's level or higher. Republicans on the Senate Intelligence Committee said Kennedy bears a specific responsibility for the security failures at Benghazi. We look at every location. There were 234 uh, incidents. Only 20 percent of them were in Benghazi. The rest of them were in Tripoli or elsewhere. The fact that the Accountability Review Board stopped below Kennedy's level was a recognition that if they had named him as the official responsible, there was no way they could have avoided uh, taking that responsibility the next couple of steps down the hallway on the State Department's seventh floor to the office of the Secretary of State. Ironically, Hicks' op-ed appeared on the one-year anniversary of one of the most enduring lines ever uttered about Benghazi and showed that despite it, interest in the story indoors. What difference at this point does it make? Greg Hicks is still employed by the State Department, but is presently on loan to the Washington think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Brett? James, thank you. Ukraine's president is calling for a special session of parliament next week to discuss the violent protests that have erupted after two months of largely peaceful anti-government demonstrations. Opposition leaders have given, given President Viktor Yanukovych until tonight to make concessions or face renewed clashes. Ukraine is just one of the many overseas hotspots on President Obama's foreign policy plate. Increasing mayhem in Iraq, discontent in Egypt, the brutal Syrian civil war, and of course, the Iran nuclear deal, which even fellow Democrats don't like. Chief, Washington, Chief White House correspondent, rather, Ed Henry tonight on the latest wrinkle. Speaking today at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani insisted his nation has a serious will to finish a nuclear deal. It is necessary that the ruling bodies in the United States accept Iran's historical realities not only in words but in actions as well. Yet Rouhani raised more questions with his own words, uttered in an interview with CNN's Fareed Zakaria, declaring he's not willing to destroy any of the centrifuge machines that are used to enrich uranium and could eventually help Iran obtain nuclear weapons. When Zakaria asked so there would be no destruction of centrifuges, Rouhani insisted not under any circumstances, not under any circumstances. Zakaria said today the comments are a train wreck because it suggests the two sides are miles apart, though at the White House, spokesman Jay Carney again shrugged it off as Rouhani spouting off for domestic consumption. We expected the Iranian government to spin uh, the commitments they made under the joint plan of action. Uh, for their domestic political purposes. Except Rouhani recently used the global audience of Twitter to charge the West had surrendered, and his latest comments were made to CNN. CNN is broadcast outside of Iran, mm -hmm. right? You could confirm. I, yeah, I've seen it here. It's not just domestic political consumption if they're talking to a broader audience. Ed, what I can tell you is that we are looking at what the Iranians are actually doing. Carney added that for a final deal to be signed in the next six months, Iran will have to dismantle a significant amount of its nuclear infrastructure. The final deal will be negotiated at a time when the latest Fox poll shows only 35 percent of the public approves of the president's handling of Iran, 53 percent disapprove. And as Republicans like John McCain ratchet up their attacks on his broader Mideast policy, the senator warning to a radio station back in Arizona, Syria is becoming a base for al-Qaeda. I have never seen anything like this in my life. I thought Jimmy Carter was bad, but he pales in comparison to this president, in my view. Now, on Iran, officials here say they finally have a commitment from Tehran to halt key aspects of their nuclear program, and now the focus among U.S. officials here is to make sure and test that they're serious about keeping their word. Brett? Ed Henry, live on the North Lawn. Ed, thank you. Up next, the man who started it all, Edward Snowden, comments on the NSA surveillance uproar. 
But first, here's what some of our Fox affiliates across the country are covering tonight. Fox 11 in Los Angeles with a lawsuit by a cheerleader for the NFL's Oakland Raiders. She reportedly accuses the team of failing to pay its cheerleaders minimum wage, disregarding their travel costs, and finding them for bringing the wrong pom-poms to practice. WSVN in Miami with the overnight arrest and arraignment of pop star Justin Bieber. The 19-year-old is accused of drag racing on a Miami Beach street, failing a sobriety test there and resisting arrest. And this is a live look at Phoenix from Fox 10. The big story out there tonight, a bus accident caused when a passenger attacked the driver. Police say the assailant appeared to be high on drugs. He was pulled off by the driver, off the driver rather, by other passengers in that bus, but not before the bus hit the highway median. 24 people were injured. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.